there are things that are changing uh, as far as some of our criteria that we're using in the first trimester. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce you to that. So I'd like to discuss the significance of some of these discriminatory levels that we have for diagnosis of miscarriage. I will uh, describe uh, in detail uh, sonographic signs of a normal first trimester pregnancy uh, and describe signs of early pregnancy failure. So first, let's go to the beginning. Uh, when the ovary releases uh, a, an ovum, it is swept up by the fimbriated end of the tube. This occurs around day 14 of a menstrual cycle. Uh, and somewhere in the tube here, the sperm meets the ovum. There's fertilization. And then the conceptus tumbles down the tube. And it takes a week to implant. So day 21 is uh, implantation day, and this is done in a very uh, aggressive um, method, manner uh, where the trophoblast burrows its way under the endometrial lining and sets up household, um, starting then with very active, aggressive uh, formation of the trophoblast. Uh, we don't see any of this until uh, four and a half weeks uh, from starting from dating by the first day of the menstrual period, so four and a half weeks menstrual age, is the earliest that we could possibly see something with ultrasound. Now, I always caution people that when they start doing first trimester scanning, and this uh, is almost all vaginal uh, approach because these are early pregnancies, the first step before you start looking in the uterus is check the cervix and make sure that the gestational sac is in the uterus. Make sure that the cervix connects with the lower uterine segment, that the anterior cervical wall connects with the anterior uterine wall, that the posterior cervical wall attaches with the posterior uterine wall. That way you are sure that this is an indeed an intrauterine pregnancy. We certainly do not want to miss um, abdominal pregnancies. We do not want to um, misinterpret <clears throat> an ectopic for an intrauterine pregnancy, or vice versa. So now, um, chronologically, what we can hope to see if we scanned every day uh, during a pregnancy, we would first see the gestational sac, next comes the yolk sac, then the embryo becomes visible, and then its heartbeat. Now, let's talk about the gestational sac. The gestational sac is a combination of the chorionic cavity and the amniotic cavity. Uh, so it shows up as a cystic structure in the um, center of the uterus, and uh, it's either round or oval in shape, has a very smooth border, has a thickened echogenic rim around it. The early little sacs um, will start being more than two millimeters in thickness, and later it gets a little thicker and thicker. So it's like a very thick crayon line around the gestational sac. This, by the way, is the same the way they look in the adnexa. In the adnexa, an ectopic has a thick echogenic rim. If you have a cystic structure with a thin rim, that is not uh, going to be uh, a pregnancy. It's going to probably be an ovarian cyst or something. So that thick border, the thickened chorionic reaction uh, is important. Now, the sac usually implants in the fundus of the uterus or in the mid-uterus. If it implants low in the uter lower uterine segment, that is not a normal kind of an implantation. So the sono early sonographic signs of an intrauterine pregnancy are basically an intradecidual sac sign and a double decidual sac sign. The intradecidual sac sign is the earliest sign of an intrauterine pregnancy. We can see it as early as four and a half weeks. It's not a very accurate sign because there are a lot of mimickers and we don't yet see a yolk sac, which would be more definitive. Uh, but it is helpful if it's present and vice versa if we do not see it that does not rule out an intrauterine pregnancy. So what we can see is below, underneath the central uh, line here, which represents uh, mucosa to mucosa in the cavity, underneath is buried this little small cystic structure with a thickened echogenic rim. Here's another one. This would be the central cavity line. And burrowed underneath is this little um, cystic structure with a somewhat thickened echogenic rim. So we would be uh, very suspicious that this is an early pregnancy and we would follow this up. 
There are mimickers. That's why this is not very reliable. You could have a little drop of fluid in the cavity. There could be endometrial, myometrial, decidual cysts. It could be a degenerated uh, myoma. So basically, we want to follow up to document development of the embryo. Here's an example. This was a uterus. And as I was scanning uh, this woman who had a positive pregnancy test and bleeding, I saw a little cystic structure and thought that that possibly could be the early pregnancy. But then I scanned the adnexa, looked around, I came back to the uterus, and it was gone. So this was just a, a drop of blood or fluid in the cavity. How about this one? Uh, this looked like it might be a little gestational sac buried under uh, the endometrial line. But this lady is 65 years old. She's a postmenopausal, and this was a postmenopausal polyp. So that's, again, very important for us to know age, um, gravidity, parity, uh, previous um, surgeries. These are important uh, pieces of information about any woman being scanned. Uh, here's, again, another one. This was a thickened endometrium, a little cystic area. Uh, maybe that's an early IUP. It turned out to be a little deciduous cyst. Uh, uh, and an ectopic was found in the adnexa. Here, we thought there might be two gestational sacs. Eventually, what happened, one of these grew as a pregnancy, the other one stayed the same. It was a cystic degeneration of a myoma. So a lot of mimickers of this early little sign, but still can be useful to us. More and more, we're hearing um, case reports and anecdotal um, uh, discussions uh, of uh, patients uh, that were given methotrexate when they were thought that maybe they had an ectopic and suddenly an intrauterine pregnancy shows up. Uh, and people are reporting this. Dubelay and Benson have written about this, um, a warning to do no harm to early pregnancies. And one of their conclusions was that uh, in a woman with a positive pregnancy test, any fluid area in the endometrial cavity is statistically likely to be an intrauterine pregnancy. It could be normal or abnormal, but still statistically it's much more likely than to be related to an ectopic pregnancy. So uh, we should give the pregnancy the benefit of the doubt, follow it up, and um, wait. Um, all potentially harmful treatments such as methotrexate uh, or d and &E, should be avoided until an IUP is definitely excluded. So we're going to look at uh, some of uh, the newer criteria later on in this talk. Now let's talk about the other one, the double decidual sac sign. Now this is another sign of intrauterine pregnancy. It's seen a little later at five to six weeks menstrual age. Uh, it's it's uh, more useful with transabdominal uh, sonography, but it can help us out periodically with the uh, transvaginal scans. And basically what we see are two thick echogenic bands around um, the pregnancy. Uh, we'll see a thick band which is surrounding the gestational sac itself. That's a combination of chorionic and decidual tissue. Then we see a thin lucent stripe, uh, hypochoic stripe, that's the uh, collapsed potential cavity. And then another thick band on the other side, and that would be the decidua parietalis. So not around the entire sac, but certainly around a portion of it. If we see that, that's very helpful to guide us towards um, an intrauterine pregnancy. This sign helps to differentiate from that pseudosac, which only has one thickened border. Uh, this sign is highly reliable, but it's not absolute. Uh, once we see a little yolk sac, it doesn't matter because then we would be sure that it's an intrauterine pregnancy. And if any suspicion or not or uncertainty arises, definitely uh, follow up, uh, make no clinical decisions based on that sign alone. Uh, here's um, a, a situation where there's some fluid in the uterus. Maybe it looks like a uh, pseudo sac related to an ectopic, but if you look, there are two thick bands of echogenicity, and that would push it towards the intrauterine pregnancy, probably a miscarriage in this case. Doppler can be helpful. Uh, we know that trophoblastic blood flow has a typically normal, uh, low resistance uh, arterial waveform. 
Uh, but I do want to caution you that we should not be using Doppler in any form, color, power, or spectral. We should not use it in a normal first trimester pregnancy unless there's an indication because this does impart more energy uh, to this uh, uh, little embryo undergoing embryogenesis and we would not want to do any harm. If the pregnancy is abnormal and we want more information, that would be justified.